All right. How about the camera? It's also recording. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, again, thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm Brooks. I think you all know me. Uh, <laughs> over the last few years, uh, under Dr. Flato, I've had the privilege to uh, work on this project. So the goal of this project has been to characterize the performance of a non-contact magnetoelastic torque sensor. And today I'm here to defend my master's thesis on that topic. So we'll start with some background matter. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the state of the art in torque sensing, and we'll focus in a little bit on magnetoelastics in particular. Uh, after going over project goals, we'll get into modeling efforts made to better understand the forces and magnetic fields acting on a prototype configuration of the sensor. Uh, we'll talk about the experimental setup and then discuss results of uh, quasi-static and dynamic tests conducted to characterize the performance of a non-contact magnetoelastic torque sensor. That would be YMET for short. Um, and we'll fin finish things up with a quick summary and a discussion of future work. So state-of-the-art technology currently enables users to measure torque using uh, two broad uh, categories of technology. So your first is the uh, laser pointer, uh, torsion bar twist angle sensor here. So uh, they're capable of providing uh, good signal to noise, accurate output, um, and they're popular commercial torque sensors. Uh, however, they usually have to be mounted in line with a shaft, and they can be uh, a bit cumbersome for retrofit uh, as a result of that. Now, among groups currently investigating magnetoelastics, uh, a company called Magcanic out in San Diego has been successful in developing a magnetoelastic torque sensor for use in uh, F1 race cars. Uh, Magcanica produces uh, a torque sensor that effectively detects changes in the magnetic field near an already magnetized shaft while torque is, or as torque is applied. So unlike most twist angle sensors, uh, you actually have a non-contact torque sensing solution with this. Um, good signal to noise, uh, relatively accurate, but you actually wind up having to send your drive shaft off to Magcanica for them to magnetize in-house. Again, cumbersome, not the ideal solution. Uh, now, within the last few years, another magnetoelastic torque sensor, uh, among others, has, uh, was prototyped on campus at UMD uh, using thin samples of rolled sheet galphenol, which is uh, an iron gallium alloy with magnetostrictive properties, uh, adhered to a drive shaft as part of a sensor package that uh, as part of a sensor package that uses a Hall effect sensor to detect the changes in magnetic field as the patch is torqued. Um, preliminary results from this uh, technology were promising, um, and further developing this technology is the focus of this thesis. So the, sem the sensor operates via a phenomenon known as a Velari effect. Here, a magnetostrictive material on our right uh, is exposed to a DC bias field, and as a compressive stress is applied, uh, to the sample, a change in the magnetic induction measured nearby uh, is observed. Um, you can also see this in the figure to the left. This is an experimental uh, B stress curve, so magnetic induction stress. Uh, for a range of applied magnetic fields, uh, as your compressive stress is varied, you see uh, different uh, magnetic induction as a result. Uh, let's see, so among materials that exhibit this effect, Iron, nic iron and nickel were uh, the two of the first to be discovered back in the 1800s. Uh, they have low saturation magnetization. That means that effectively on this previous plot, they see a smaller change in induction uh, than other materials. Uh, but they do have uh, good mechanical properties. They're flexible, they're easy to work with, uh, and they're strong. Uh, Turfinol D, another magnetostrictive material, was developed in the 70s by the Naval Ordnance Lab. Uh, Again, here, good uh, saturation magnetization, so it works better as a sensor, effectively. <coughs> Wider range of operation as a sensor. Um, but it exhibits moderate hysteresis, and it's brittle, so it's difficult to uh, use as a structural sensing element. Uh, meanwhile, galphenol and alphenol, which wound up being used in this project, have uh, higher saturation magnetization than terphenol D, uh, low hysteresis, uh, and they have material or mechanical properties similar to those of iron and nickel. So they're a good solution to this problem. And again, galphenol and alphenol wind up being used for the rest of the sensors in this uh, presentation. So the prototype YMET sensor uh, featured a galphenol patch mounted to an aluminum shaft, uh, adhesively bonded to an aluminum shaft rather, uh, a Hall effect sensor positioned over the edge of the shaft and a magnet which provided a DC bias to the patch. Uh, 
Uh, you can see, effectively, it's a, a magnetic circuit here. So again, bias to the patch, travels across air, travels across an air gap, measured by the Hall effect sensor, and then travels back to the opposite pole. Now, as a shear is, uh, sorry, as a torque <coughs> is applied to the shaft, a shear develops on the patch. The magnetic bias to the patch is the same, but you see an increase in the measured flux density uh, by the Hall effect sensor mounted above the edge of the shaft. Now, the prototype YMET sensor responded linearly to changes in applied torque uh, less than about 50, uh, less than about 50 inch pounds, uh, but it lost linearity in excess of that. So the figures here demonstrate, again, just this decrease in sensitivity as RPM increase and as loading increases. So, but, but again, this, this demonstrated that the concept worked. This, this technology works as a torque sensor. Um, so these preliminary results motivated further research into developing this sort of magnetoelastic torque sensor, and it also uh, provided incentive to look at alphanol as a potential magnetostrictive sensing element. Uh, so with the input of collaborators at US Army Research Lab, we came up with this list of research objectives uh, to help guide the, the development of this technology. This thesis uh, focuses on two and three. We touch on four through six in future work, and uh, topic one here was investigated by undergraduates uh, while this project progressed. Um, so with that, let's get into, uh, so with these preliminary, <laughs> with, with this all in mind, let's get into our discussion of modeling, where we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the forces and magnetic fields acting on this sensor configuration. So considering a rod in pure torsion, which uh, we have here, uh, shear stress tau is going to be proportional to the applied torque T. Uh, the induction you see in the patch is going to be proportional to tau. The field measured by a Hall effect sensor is going to be proportional to B. And the change in voltage you see uh, in, in the Hall effect sensor is going to be proportional to that applied magnetic field. So as, additional, as torque is applied to the shaft, you see a change in induction, which is measured by the Hall effect sensor as uh, a change in voltage. Now, in, in our setup, again, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a sample adhered to a shaft, and you're spinning it up. It's, it's pure torsion, no mm -hmm. effectively no axial forces acting on the shaft. Uh, so we only have uh, tau to consider. We have the bias magnet applying a 3D applied magnetic field. Uh, so in our COMSOL modeling, we separately look at uh, the shear stress acting on the shaft as a result of torque, and we also look at the uh, magnetic fields acting on the magnetostrictive material in three dimensions. So we use a multi-physics program called COMSOL. We, look at, uh, we use a structural mechanics module to look at the shear and an AC-DC module to look at uh, the field. Um, on the right, we have some modeling assumptions just regarding elements included. Um, so yes, uh, so in order to accurately model everything, we used an extra, I used an extra fine mesh to make sure that some of the smaller elements, especially the, uh, the patch and the magnet, um, were properly rendered and modeled. Um, but all right, so getting into some results here. Uh, so. We took a look at the stress that you should expect to see along the length of the shaft. Uh, so again, this is considering a solid alum aluminum shaft fixed at the left end with a 200 inch pound torque applied. Uh, the volume maximum stress that you see in the patch is about 10 megapascals, and you see that along the bottom edge, right down there. Um, the aluminum shaft sees about six megapascals um, around the surface here and about five on the surface of the patch. Um, you can see that stress and strain decrease uh, along the length of the shaft in this model. Uh, in terms of modeling the magnetics, uh, what we're really looking at here is you see uh, flux leakage from the corners and the edges of the patch. And looking at the flux density um, on the base of the Hall effect sensor and on the edge of the material right underneath of it, you actually see about a 50% reduction in measured magnetic flux. And that, that will come into play a little bit later. So considering these estimates for stress and field, we take a look at uh, the induction stress curves uh, that I showed earlier, which were generated for galphenol by uh, Atulacima and others. Uh, so at, at this point in, in our analysis, we're pretty sure that we want to operate along this green curve right here. It's at a low applied magnetic field, and it gives you a very uh, large range of magnetic induct resultant magnetic induction there. Uh, 
as a relatively uh, small stress is applied. However, uh, for this to work, you need a Hall effect sensor that can effectively measure a one Tesla change in uh, magnetic flux. Uh, the higher curves here are usable, uh, but they're lower sensitivity. So we, have, we had a bit of a trade-off here to consider. So whether to operate along those higher curves with low sensitivity or whether to risk uh, saturation of the sensor by operating along these lower curves. Uh, so with, with these modeling results in mind, we'll continue to a discussion of the, the experimental setup and some considerations made prior to quasi-static and dynamic testing of the sensor. So uh, magnetostrictive samples were adhered to uh, the shaft along the test section, represented here for quasi-static testing and represented here for dynamic. Uh, in cases where you see one sample plus another, those were simply tested in the same location at different times. Now. Galphenol and alphenol, again, were used as uh, magnetostrictive sensing elements in these experiments. For galphenol, we had uh, two samples, one of which we'll be talking about today. Um, two patches of the same shape were tested, along with uh, a galphenol paint composed of uh, galphenol flakes and an epoxy in a one-to-one -one ratio. It was literally painted onto the shaft. Uh, for alphenol, we have three rings of varied thickness, and we also have uh, an alphenol patch, and you can see a couple of those samples down along the bottom here. Now, the galphenol and the alphenol patches were tested to directly compare the response of each material with, uh, without any shape considerations in mind. Uh, meanwhile, the, the paint and the rings were tested as sort of the, the, extremes, of, uh, the extremes of potential uh, shape effects. So these samples were tested using uh, this benchtop test setup over in the manufacturing building. It uh, can be modified for use in a quasi-static mode or a dynamic mode. Uh, so using this test setup, preliminary tests were first conducted to try to uh, maximize YMED output signal to noise. Um, and we did this by uh, varying a, a few, a few uh, sensor parameters. So when we're thinking about this, in order to maximize your output signal, uh, you have to take a few things into account. So we know that the Hall effect sensor should be positioned over the edge of the patch. That's where we're going to see the largest change in induction as a torque is applied. Um, but other than that, we have to consider the, the strength of the bias magnet, the position of the magnet, and the offset between the Hall effect sensor and the patch. Now, for magnet selection, I, I did try uh, a range of magnet strengths, but uh, the, one, the 135 magnet, which was used in the YMET, 135 millitesla magnet, which was used in the YMET device, uh, wound up being the most effective in preliminary trials. Uh, Hall effect sensor output signal was measured while we varied these parameters, magnet position along the length of the flux piece, and the offset between the, the bottom of the Hall effect sensor and the surface of the patch. Um, as we moved the magnet along, we applied a 50 inch pound load to the shaft, um, and as you can see, as you get closer to the Hall effect sensor, you actually wind up seeing a larger change in signal. Uh, likewise, uh, as you decrease the distance between the hall sensor and the patch, as loads are applied, you see a larger change in signal the closer you are. So the configuration we wound up going with was <laughs> magnet mounted over the patch with uh, a sm very small standoff of 0.01 inches between the uh, hall effect sensor and the shaft. So after some of this preliminary testing, uh, non-uniformities in the bi-directional response of this material, or of the sensor in quasi-static testing were noted. That's as you apply loads in either direction, you get an evaluation of the, the sensitivity of the, the material. Uh, so uh, as, as we took a look at these preliminary results, we noted there were some uh, non-uniformities in response, uh, whether it was in signal drift or just in signal response in general. So after presenting some of these results to our collaborators at Aberdeen, it was suggested that this may have been due to an imperfect uh, adhesive bond layer between the patch and the shaft. Uh, so therefore, an effort was made to standardize the adhesive application protocol to reduce the concern that this would wind up uh, affecting sensor response. So this was achieved uh, through parametric variation of these variables, varied sandpaper grit, varied the torque applied as the bond cured, and varied the volume of adhesive used uh, along with these patterns of adhesive application down here. Uh, tested over six rounds. These are the combination of variables we used. And the goal was to form a uniform bond layer. That's one with uh, 
very low variance between uh, thicknesses in the, uh, the adhesive itself. Uh, so the final bond protocol we wound up going with, uh, using very low grit sandpaper that lets you, or that provides a higher surface area for the adhesive to glob onto as it's curing. Uh, 15 inch pound applied torque, uh, using a torque wrench to tighten a hose clamp, uh, gives you a thinner and stronger bond, um, and using uh, 0.05 milliliters of an adhesive evenly applied along the bottom. Uh, Repeatability of this bond was demonstrated in nine out of 10 cases, and I'll get to the one in just a second. Uh, but the adhesive volume was also scaled. Uh, that testing was done with a steel sh with, with steel shim and a secondary shaft, so as not to damage our primary test section or our magnetostrictive sample. So the amount of adhesive used was scaled up depending on the size of the, uh, the sample. Um, so some additional observations that we made. That one out of, one out of 10 repeatability case that we saw high variability there because of a structural imperfection in the shim itself. So the analog would be if a galphenol or an alphanol patch had an imperfection in it and was then you know, used on the test section. Um, you, know, you see a pooling of adhesive here and you barely get any on the rest of the surface. Uh, so bad bond layer there. Um, it's important that you uh, roughen the entire surface of the shaft and the material you're sticking onto it. Uh, you can see air bubbles form here if you're not too careful. And if you apply uh, less torque than, well, 15 inch pounds in our case, there was a chance that you would uh, form an incomplete bond layer. So moving on to um, a bit on bidirectional quasi-static testing. So after finishing these preliminary tests, I moved on to, uh, again, this bidirectional quasi-static testing with uh, galphenol and alphenol samples. So in this mode, you, I applied torques of 50, 100, 150, and 200 inch pounds uh, bidirectionally to the shafts by placing 5, 10, 15, and 20 pound weights 10 inches down a moment arm uh, from the center axis of the shaft here. Now, something we noticed while we were uh, conducting quasi-static testing, uh, these guys right here are flexible couplings. They're used in the dynamic mode to make sure that you don't get excess vibration in the system, but when you test in the quasi-static mode with them, you actually see uh, a noticeable effect um, in terms of shaft rotation. Uh, so a camera was mounted, uh, to qu quantify this a bit, a camera was mounted above the test section. Images were taken of uh, the patch with two etches made uh, during and after load application. And by comparing the two, we were able to uh, get an idea of how much the shaft was rotating. So we used image J, or I used image J, which was developed by the NIH, uh, to draw a line down the shaft there, uh, label the top and the bottom that gives us a midpoint. And then from there, you can draw a line down to either etch. Um, X1 represents an unloaded state. X2 represents a loaded state. You calculate the angular position of those etches at either state, and you get an idea of how much the shaft is rotated at a given load application. So what we wind up seeing was, if you look at just theoretical twist of an aluminum shaft, nine inches down the shaft under application of a 200 inch pound load, you should expect less than a degree of twist. We were seeing about seven uh, due to the effect of the couplings. Now, this was comparable in either direction. And it's, it's, at this point, it was unknown whether or not this would impact the sensitivities that we wound up calculating uh, for our materials in the quasi-static or dynamic mode. But um, in order to mitigate any potential effects, we wound up placing the Hall effect sensor over the center of the edge of the patch to minimize any effect this might have on uh, signal magnitude. So in order to determine if the location where samples were mounted along the shaft would have any influence on eventual performance, uh, we mounted strain gauges um, at either end of the test section 10 inches apart, uh, applied loads, and we got values for strain uh, as those loads were applied. They were, they were mounted at 45 degrees, so they were along the uh, direction of principal, spain, or principal strain that you should expect in uh, rod and torsion. And experimental results effectively told us that we shouldn't see too much of a difference and we shouldn't really expect positioning to necessarily uh, impact uh, sensor performance. However, our model says slightly otherwise. So compared to modeling results, uh, 
A, 60, a roughly 60% decrease in strain should be expected over that same 10-inch uh, uh, length. Uh, and this, it's not particularly well explained. Uh, additionally, a 10% decrease in strain was noted between the patch and the shaft uh, compared to about a 54% experimental decrease. This was expected. The, uh, the bond was modeled as perfect in COMSOL. In reality, you have an interstitial bond layer between the sensing element and the shaft, um, and that affects the strain you see on the surface. Okay, so moving on to some dynamic testing protocol here. Um, the setup was modified slightly. We stuck a motor on the end where we used to apply loads and installed a magnetic particle brake so you could apply torque while the, shaft, while the system was rotating. Uh, and dynamic testing looked to characterize sensor performance between zero and 2,000 RPM and uh, within this applied torque range uh, in either direction. Now, dynamic operation was constrained by a couple of the system components. So the particle brake, uh, the particle brake and the commercial torque sensor. So in order per to prevent overheating of the brake, uh, it was only run at up to 2,000 RPM and only for about 10 seconds at a time. Uh, meanwhile, the commercial torque sensor, just by virtue of its manufacturer details, had a limit of 200 inch pounds. Let's see. Yep. Uh, and so in the dynamic mode, torque was applied, again, using that magnetic particle brake. Uh, based on this calibration curve to the right, uh, you feed a voltage into the brake, you get a torque out, and this was uh, used to determine, again, the, the torque applied to the system at a given uh, input voltage. Uh, and then the tables below list the cases at which uh, samples were tested under positive rotation and under negative rotation. These are applied loads in inch pounds. Uh, so from here, we'll actually get into a discussion of results. So we'll start with quasi-static and then move on to dynamic. <coughs> here we go. So quasi-static tests were run for about two minutes at a time. Uh, this figure right here shows actually six tests uh, superimposed into one. If you look over here, it's a blown up image of this. Uh, you can see three curves up here, three curves down there. These are three uh, applications of plus 50 inch pounds. These are three applications of minus 50 inch pounds. Now. Over the course of each run, the Hall effect sensor output and the commercial torque sensor output signals were recorded simultaneously so you could compare the two. Uh, mean signal during each load application was calculated during the middle 10 seconds of each, of each load just to avoid uh, getting data from this increase as you apply a load or this decrease as you remove a load. Uh, error was calculated as standard error of the mean between uh, number of test cases and drift was calculated by looking at a one second window on either end of this 10 second window, comparing the two, and then calculating that drift as a percent of the mean signal here. So moving on to the results. Uh, the samples evaluated in this test going from left to right were galphenol patch in blue here, alphanol patch in green here, uh, two alphanol rings of different thicknesses in orange and black. Then down here, these little guys, the galphenol paint in the aluminum shaft. You can see it blown up here a little bit. You do actually see an increase in the, in the paint, but the signal out of the aluminum shaft is pretty much minimal. Now, for all other cases other than, uh, other than the aluminum shaft, you do you see a bi-directional increase in signal. So you have your low load cases over here and your higher load cases out here. And again, it, uh, you've got increasing negative, increasing positive. So as you apply larger and larger positive loads, you see a larger Hall effect sensor output, and the same goes for the negative direction. Now, the magnitude of these responses are actually a factor of two to three greater than what we were seeing before the, uh, the adhesive bonding protocol was implemented. So that was an exciting result. Uh, taking a look at these curves individually a bit, the, the alphanol patch, which again is in green here, uh, outperformed the galphenol patch, which is in blue, in just about every load case here. Uh, and again, these were of similar shape. Uh, the alphanol rings provided a response of similar magnitude, especially in the higher load cases. So you look at these two here, these two here. But you see that the thinner ring tends to outperform uh, the thicker ring across uh, all cases, even though the higher ones are comparable. Uh, let's see here. Uh, talking a bit about the, the drift seen in these tests. Overall, uh, the drift, again, that's as percent mean voltage uh, or as percent as percent of your signal out um, was below 2.5% of mean um, across the board. It tended to decrease 
as higher loads were applied, but you did see some outliers here for the galphenol and for the ring. Uh, so a subset of those results are, again, just the galphenol and the alphanol results here. So uh, these were averaged together over three test runs in which all torques were applied in a random order. Uh, across the test, you again see that same bidirectional increase in signal with the alphanol consistently outperforming the galphenol. Um, but their uh, sensitivity is, is similar. Uh, now, what is sensitivity? So sensitivity is this, uh, this linear fit here. It's, it's effectively the, the slope of the response, the, uh, the rise, which is your increase, or your, your increase in sensor voltage over your run, which is uh, increasing applied torque. So this is how we wound up evaluating sensitivity as millivolts per applied inch pound of torque. Um, let's see. So yeah, moving on. Now, considering uh, the sensitivity as I just described, uh, galphenol wound up exhibiting uh, the lowest sensitivity of the four samples tested. Uh, the bidirectional response of alphanol was fairly similar. You saw, again, a bit of non-uniformity here uh, for the thinner ring, and again, a uh, little bit lower in the positive case than the negative case uh, for all samples, actually. Um, and again, drift was uh, relatively minimal. Uh, so let's see. Um, and again, looking, looking at the two rings, the, the thinner of them tended to provide the higher output and the highest, higher sensitivity. OK, so moving on uh, to dynamic results. So tests here were run for about 10 seconds at a time. Uh, I applied a 10 seconds at a time, again, just to ensure that the brake didn't overheat. Um, once per rotation, the peak signal right up here was recorded. Um, and all peak values were averaged over what wound up being a five second window uh, to provide a mean signal for, a, for given input conditions, again, being RPM and applied torque. Uh, a filter, a moving average filter was implemented to eliminate outliers. Uh, you can see that implemented right here at uh, 500 RPM. It's a span three moving average filter. We, we considered filters of higher span, uh, but what, what we wound up seeing was, uh, this is a span five filter here. Um, we did wind up seeing a large reduction in what we got out, or in, in signal output. It's also worth noting that this is at 2000 RPM, so something we did wind up seeing as we applied this moving average filter, the, uh, the magnitude of the response for uh, our dynamic results actually shifted down uh, the y-axis a little bit, uh, less, less than 100 millivolts, I believe, uh, as uh, higher RPMs were applied. So yeah, uh, taking a look at some dynamic results here. So these are baseline measurements taken over the aluminum shaft. You can see that uh, this was tested using two YMET sensors to confirm accuracy. Uh, and again, just over the shaft, you don't see much of a response. The, the bounds here, this is, uh, let's see, that's, yeah, it's about 100 millivolts between the two, but you're really only seeing a response of about 10 millivolts, uh, yeah, 10 millivolts over a 100 pound inch load, so not, not very high. Mm. So in evaluating the repeatability of signal acquisition, uh, using two separate YMET sensors, we, we did this for the galphenol patch, we did this for the alphanol patch and the ring. Um, you can see, again, a uh, linear fit uh, trend here after uh, this region of decrease in signal. You can see that uh, in most cases they're relatively similar, a uh, little bit steeper for sensor one here, a little bit shallower for sensor two here, a little bit steeper for sensor two here, a little bit shallower slope for sensor one here. Uh, but the rings provide very, very similar uh, slopes over the whole range of applied torques, uh, which means they uh, are giving us similar sensitivities, but in, in that case. Um, we also looked at this for the paint. Um, and again, you see a, a similar response between the two, a little bit uh, steeper slope or higher sensitivity in this case, uh, the, in one case than the other. Now, these plots demonstrate sensor response during, a bi during bidirectional loading for all four samples. Uh, so you've got your negative loads on one side, positive loads on another. Um, you've got galphenol, alphenol, uh, both patches up here, galphenol paint down here, and an alphenol ring sample down there. Uh, 
Uh, in all four cases, you can see a distinct variation in response depending on the direction of rotation. Uh, so you see a positive slope here, or sorry, a, a sharper slope on the positive side than the negative side here, and again, that trend uh, continues for all of these. Now, from here, we wind up varying RPM under positive spin uh, for each material. We took a look at uh, 500 RPM, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. And we also plotted the quasi-static results as zero here. Now it's it's a little tough, little tough to see here. There's you know this uh, this decrease in uh, sensor voltage going er, here at the beginning. Uh, but what we actually see when we apply that linear fit to all four of these, we actually see very very similar sensitivities, regardless of uh, the regardless of the RPM uh, that you're operating at. Um, so again, very, very similar, very similar sensitivities in all of these cases. Um, likewise, the results for alphanol are plotted in a similar manner. So you have galphanol up here, alphanol uh, before this linear fit is applied here and after it's applied here. You can see that there's a bit of irregularity down here at uh, higher RPM, but again, you do see uh, these linear increasing uh, sensitivities uh, for lower RPM cases. Um, additionally, we did this for the ring and the paint, and here are all four samples together. So, galphanol in the top left, alphanol in the top right, uh, paint down the bottom left, ring down bottom right. So, the patch provides very similar sensitivities between your quasi-static mode and your dynamic mode here over this range of response uh, in excess of about 50 inch-pounds. The alphanol patch provides similar sensitivity at low RPM. So right up here, uh, 500 compared to say zero. But again, at those higher RPMs, you see uh, a bit of irregularity there. Uh, for the ring, you see very similar slopes between, sorry, there's my laser pointer. For the ring, you see very similar slopes between the dynamic cases, but it looks as if the uh, quasi-static estimate has a slightly higher sensitivity than the dynamic. Um, and the paint provided a response. Uh, again, positive uh, sensitivity here. So again, an increasing signal as you apply a load. Uh, for what it's worth, these y-axes are uh, 300 millivolts compared to about 60 here. So the degree of response in the case of the paint is much lower than you see in the, uh, the rings and the patches. Now, the observations from that previous slide are summarized in this table. And again, uh, our definition of sensitivity being our change in uh, Hall effect sensor output over a range of applied torques. Um, taking the, the average of the four RPM cases we see here, we see that uh, much like in the quasi-static case, the alphanol patch outperforms the galphanol, uh, albeit slightly here. Uh, the ring. Uh, again, as in the quasi-static case, has a lower sensitivity than the alphanol. Um, and you see relatively good agreement uh, for w with the ring at least in respect to uh, sensitivity in the plus or minus rotation direction. Uh, again, in, in all of these cases, as I pointed out earlier, you actually saw a higher sensitivity in the positive mode than in the, the negative mode. Um, and again, overall, the paint provided the lowest response, but um, it provided a response, which was exciting in and of itself. <laughs> uh, so putting it all together. Uh, so quasi-static testing measured a galphanol sensitivity between 0.43 and 0.59 millivolts per inch pounds. Uh, now we have to ask ourselves, is this consistent with the, the rest of the results in, that I've presented here? So. We examined that original, uh, that original sensor curve for galphanol. Again, magnetic induction on the Y, applied stress on the X, and then uh, different curves for different applied fields. If you take a look at the 0 uh, megapascal condition and the 10 megapascal condition, you can actually get an estimate of what the induction at either of those points is. Uh, taking the difference between the two, we have this column here. We know that. We know from COMSOL modeling estimates, we should expect to see at uh, a 0.01 inch offset between the Hall effect sensor and the patch, we should expect to see about half as much flux on the Hall effect sensor as on the patch. Uh, so we cut that in half here. Uh, 
Uh, and again, this is the induction experienced by the Hall effect sensor. Uh, that's scaled by uh, the sensitivity of the Hall effect sensor itself. It provides 130 millivolt output uh, per millitesla measured. Uh, and we know that uh, 200, in, it, based on our model, uh, 200 inch pounds roughly corresponds to uh, 10 megapascals here. So we have, uh, based on this plot and this sort of operating window we got from modeling, an estimated sensitivity of sensor response depending on the applied field to uh, the galvanol specifically in this case. And we see based on our estimate, uh, again, between about 0.4 and 0.6, we fit between uh, these two curves, which are uh, 223 Orsted applied field and 446 Orsted applied field. That would be uh, this little region down here. Again, it's cut off here uh, because that is our negative 10 MPA stress case and it's bounded by these two curves. Now the exciting thing is that this is consistent with our experimental data. We wound up using uh, a magnet with a uh, surface field measured as 135 millitesla. Uh, considered as Orsted in air, that's approximately a 1 to 10 conversion. And we know, again, the air gap between the Hall effect sensor and the patch, that'd be right there, uh, is going to give us about a 50% decrease in measured flux. The magnet is further away than the patch, so we should expect to see a greater than 50% decrease uh, in measured flux. So we know that our applied field curve should be uh, below about 700 Orsted. So it confirms that it should be about in this re region. Uh, so, in the end, uh, we've got our COMSOL estimate here. Well, sorry, not, not quite our COMSOL estimate, but our estimate using a tool of SEMA's uh, uh, B stress curve here, uh, bounded by our COMSOL model. Uh, we have our positive rotation in the quasi-static case, and we have our dynamic uh, sensitivity for, well, for our dynamic case. Again, this is all for galphenol, so we can see that these sensitivities line up and they line up with the model. So the experimental values are within that proposed operating range. Um, now I, I showed this figure off a little bit earlier. This is the output of the prototype YMET sensor. Uh, so the blue boxes here represent uh, what are effectively the operating windows of the sensor considering uh, a galvanol patch over 2000 RPM here and over about 1800 RPM here. Um, now the interesting thing is the y-axis here. So this is over about 300 millivolts. This is over about 30. So uh, over the course of this project, we've managed to take the prototype and effectively uh, 10 times its yield, uh, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, again, we see, a, uh, we see that difference in response, uh, or sorry, not, not difference in response, but we see this negative, tre negative sloping uh, trend below 50 uh, inch pounds in my data, and again we see this nice linear increase in the dynamic in agreement with the quasi-static right there. Um, and in uh, Raganoff's data, you you actually also see that uh, that initial decrease, but you see a continued decrease in his. So uh, we're still trying to address that. But uh, just to wrap things up, in conclusion, uh, testing demonstrated linear regions of sensitivity in YMET output over. 0 to 2,000 RPM for torques between 50 and 200 inch-pounds. Uh, improvement to the bonding protocol increased uh, sensitivity before and after by a factor of 2 to 3, depending on the sample tested. Uh, testing extended the concept originally evaluated by uh, Raganath and others to different alloys, namely alphanol, and different aspect ratios, namely rings and the paint samples for galphenol. Uh, during dynamic operation, um, that unexpected trend in low torque response below 50 to 70 inch-pounds was identified in magnetostrictive patches, but it was not identified in rings. You actually saw uh, an increase in sensitivity uh, for those regions. Uh, and finally, it was determined that the capabilities of a Hall effect sensor, uh, due to a point, limit the limit YMET's dynamic range. Again, looking back at some of these curves, if, if you're looking to operate with uh, a Hall effect sensor here, you know, you've got a five volt window. You can read maybe 19 millitesla at the offset we were at. Uh, by using an induction coil, you can actually remove this limitation um, and uh, extend the dynamic range of the sensor effectively. Um, future work uh, pertains mainly to further improving sensor response and evaluating what it'll take to operate the sensor at uh, 
uh, more realistic in, in more realistic operating environments. And we've had really productive conversations with some of our contract or contacts in, in industry and in the government about what we can do uh, regarding that. Uh, but that about wrap thing, wraps things up. Uh, thank you to Army AATD, uh, this award number through VLRCOE, who supported this research. Uh, our collaborators at ARL, NSWC, and Innovital, uh, who helped us out with uh, setting project goals and informing us on sensor operation along the way. Thank you to the entire Aerosmart team, uh, Dr. Flato, these two right here. Shin <laughs> uh, along back there as well. Um, and our, the rest of our uh, <laughs> postdoc researchers and undergrads who couldn't be here. And then my family and friends who, without, <laughs> without whom uh, this would not have been possible. So thank you all for taking the time to come here and listen. <laughs> thank you, Kyle, for the Go Brooks sign. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but yeah, again, thank you all. It means a lot that you were here, uh, and I'd love to open the floor to questions. All right. The floor is open. The floor is open. <laughs> you slide, sure. I think it was a console model of the torque distribution on uh, the rod. Yep, I, I think I know the one you mean. Let's see, this guy right here? Yeah. Sure. So the, um, so the, the, the color bar is different values of? Different values of von Meissy stress. OK. So yep. and what's the loading condition? The loading condition is 200 inch pounds applied uh, radially. Um, so you, know, you can see here, you see these little divisions along the uh, the top and the edges. What, what Compsol actually does when it's rendering these uh, 3D figures, uh, it splits up uh, circular cylindrical objects into quadrants. So what I wound up doing was applying um, a quarter of the desired load, you know, radially, radially in each of those sections. So again, it's 200 inch pounds applied uh, uh, in the positive, positively in this case. Right, the, yeah, let me uh, flip ahead to that. Let me see here. So one of the interesting results out of this, uh, let's see, yeah, we, want, uh, we want this one right here. So in terms, of, in terms of reasoning, so we had thought that it might be, uh, thinking back to those, uh, those B stress curves, those experimentally generated B stress curves like this, we thought that, I thought that um, at very low stress, it might have something to do with uh, just beginning to dip down along one of those curves or just coming out of the bottom of it there. There's uh, also the potential that it had to do with uh, reorientation of magnetic domains as uh, loads were first applied to the shaft. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. You actually, considering just shape, so if you look at the galphenol patch and the alphenol patch, you see this initial decrease in signal. Um, and you also see it to an extent in the paint, but you don't see it in the ring. You actually see an increase followed by more increase. So there's a very real potential that that's some sort of shape related effect. So so why is the behavior changing with RPM? Uh, why is the behavior changing with RPM? So going back to uh, this a little bit, the way that I filtered the data, or the way that I took an average of the data. So again, it was a moving average of every three elements. So what that does is you can see right here, uh, you've got the peak value there. It actually winds up reducing that peak value by a little bit. That is amplified at higher RPMs. Uh, so I, I think at least in part, that change in RPM is due to the way that the data was processed. Uh, that being said, I, I would have much I'm, I'm glad that I wound up processing the data because there were outliers that needed to be eliminated from the set. So it was either, uh, really it wound up being uh, this span three moving average or, well, not nothing, but this was the best option that we wound up seeing. Do you have that chart where you actually blow up the region around the spike? I guess the question that arises is what's your 
sampling frequency is as compared to the residence time of the patch under the sensor. Hmm. And certainly as you go to higher RPMs at residence, the number of samples... It decreases. ...is going to decrease. Yes. And you were talking about flux loss at the edges anyway. Mm -hmm. So your expectation would be there'd be a little plateau in the middle where you're getting something similar to an infinite plate underneath it. Mm -hmm. So have you, have you, I mean, are you getting three samples per pass? Or are you getting 3,000 samples per pass? So we sampled at 1,000 hertz. So what we wound up seeing was, I, I wish I could blow this up a little bit more. Actually, I can. Hold on. Let me pop out of this and... Yes, definitely a factor. So you look here, again, this is a this is a case where I think we were running at 500 RPM with a moving average filter of three. So you actually see at every peak, you're getting a, a good number of data points here. I think it something on the order of uh, six or eight. A little bit closer to 10, uh, based on what I remember, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, that being said, you're absolutely right. At higher RPMs, you would see maybe maybe about three. So that the application of that moving average filter combined with the sampling rate absolutely wound up decreasing your signal output as RPM increased. Oh, in yes, in regard. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. In regards to um, in regards to why we were seeing that uh, the discrepancies down here, the, the or not discrepancies, but rather the difference in response. So that that's the thing. So with with these materials, we don't apply a uh, compressive pre-stress, which would normally align the, dom the magnetic domains in a certain direction uh, before operation starts. So if you apply compressive pre-stress, you know that you're going to get a change in induction in a, one direction, effectively. Uh, but without that pre-stress pre applied, uh, you have domains not necessarily oriented along the same direction. So that initial response could potentially be the result of that, that, that lack of initial pre-stress. Because with, the, with your rotation, all you're getting is a centrifugal force, which is a hmm. tension force. So I was trying to find out why the behavior is changing with the, with the rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, again, uh, kind of piggybacking off of what uh, Dr. Aiken had mentioned, one, one cause for that decrease in signal magnitude as RPM increases is certainly the way that the data was filtered. Again, it was using a moving average filtered or a moving average filter. Uh, da, da, da. So at low RPM, it was fine. You get a large number of data points to draw from. But at higher RPM, you know, you probably have about three at the peak, maybe. So you, you actually wind up seeing, again, not a response quite as uh, distinct as this, where the peak values are up here and the filtered values are down there. Again, that was using a, a, a higher span, effectively. This was a span 5 filter at 2,000. But you do definitely wind up seeing uh, these peak values decrease as a result of the way the data was filtered as RPM increases. Has anybody tested these specimen in pure tension or pure com and pure compression? In pure tension and in pure, com or pure tension, pure compression, yes. 